Hi, I'm John, and I'm going to show you how you can write your own custom optimization for LLVM. So you might be wondering, why would I write a custom optimization? What would that gain me? Well, as a contrived example, computer scientists and software developers know that comparing the result of floating point operations for equality isn't likely to result in a real accurate true or false value because of rounding errors. So if you had two floating point values, A and B, and they were a result of operations involving square root and division of the square root, for example, you wouldn't compare the equality of A to B. You would subtract B from A, take the result as an absolute value, and compare that to some predetermined epsilon value. And that would tell you if these two values, A and B, are almost equal without having to worry about any of the rounding problems. That's certainly more code to write than just a simple equality comparison operation. But what if I told you you could compare two floating point values using a regular equality comparison operator and still have the absolute difference of those values compared against some epsilon value without having to write all of that code? That's what a custom optimization could do for you, and that's what I'm going to show you how to do. Now there's a huge caveat involved with this, not so much a caveat as a giant neon warning sign. What I just described is not something you should ever do, because you're completely changing the semantics of the source language, in this case C++, like the hat says. So don't do this in production. This is just an example of something that you can do. To get started, you're going to need the Clang and LLVM source code, at least version 9. You should be fine to simply fetch the latest source from the LLVM project GitHub repository. I'm using a commit from April 8th, 2020. You'll only need to build Clang and LLVM. If you're on Windows and using Visual Studio, I encourage you to also build LLD as it can noticeably speed up your linking steps. You're also going to need a compiler toolchain to actually build the Clang and LLVM source. The newer the better. If you're using Microsoft Visual C++, you'll need at least version 2017. If you're using GCC, you'll need 5.1 or newer, with a heavy emphasis on newer. I strongly recommend GCC version 9.3. You can also use Clang itself, which is what I'll be doing. The minimum required version is 3.5, but again, I'd strongly recommend at least version 9. I'll be using Clang 10 with Visual Studio 2019. Along with your compiler toolchain, you're going to need CMake version 3.4.3, but again, I strongly recommend the latest version. If you're using Visual Studio, make sure you have CMake support installed. Finally, you'll need to be running any modern operating system. I'll be using both Ubuntu Linux 18 and Windows 10. So, I could spend an entire video on different ways to build Clang and LLVM with CMake. It's better just to read the official documentation to get you started. I promise it's easy. I'm just going to give you some extra information on how to configure your build for past development purposes. I will say one thing. Ninja builds everything noticeably faster than any other build system I've used. It's not required, but I do urge you to use it. Your source tree should be laid out something like this, with the Clang and LLVM directories being siblings under the same directory. When you run CMake to configure your build, give it the path to the LLVM source directory. The CMake files in it will find and configure Clang without having to provide any other paths. The same holds true for any other LLVM projects you choose to build, such as LLD. There are some CMake variables you'll want to set for your build configuration step. The first one is the LLVM enable projects variable. This is a semicolon separated list of source directories that should be built along with the LLVM. Just their names, not their full paths. At a minimum, you'll want to set this to be Clang. As I said earlier, if you're using Visual Studio on Windows, you can optionally enable the LLD project so you can use it as your linker. If you want to try using your pass during link time optimization, which isn't something I'll be getting into in this video, you'll need to build LLD regardless of your operating system. You could install Clang and LLVM to the default system path, but since we'll be modifying its code, I don't recommend it, especially if you're using Mac OS, since you could potentially replace your native toolchain in the process. Instead, install it to a subdirectory in your home directory or some other non-system default location. You do this by setting the CMake install prefix variable. After installing, you can export LLVM's bin directory to your system path variable if you don't feel like writing the entire thing. If you want to step through your paths for debugging purposes, which you'll probably want to do at some point anyway, set CMake build type to debug. Along with that, set LLVM optimized table gen to true. There are two table gen binaries that are built and used during the build process for important purposes like generating instruction set definitions for LLVM's target backends. If these are built in debug mode, they'll be built without any optimizations, and they'll be extremely slow. We won't be doing any table gen related development, so there's no reason to burden yourself with that. 
This is just an example of the commands that you might run to check out the Clang and LLVM source and build them and install them. Before we roll into writing our optimization, it's important to understand the basics of LLVM, so I'll give a 30,000 foot overview. In the compilation phases, high-level source code is parsed and converted to LLVM Intermediate Representation, or IR. This is the job of the front-end compiler, and this is what Clang does primarily with C and C++. Other languages, such as Rust, also have compilers that convert their code to LLVM IR. At this level, the code is mostly target-independent, but certainly not platform-independent, as the source language still dictates things like endianness and ABI-specific entities, such as calling conventions. IR is then lowered to machine IR, which is simply a machine-specific representation of the higher-level IR, as the name implies. Here, the IR starts to logically resemble platform-specific assembly. The LLVM target backend then lowers the machine IR to assembly, which is itself lowered to object code. While these steps essentially happen at the same time, it's easier to show what happens by separating them. The linker then takes the object code and links it together in the final linking stage, which produces the output executable. Optimizations almost exclusively occur in the IR and machine IR lowering phases. We won't be getting into machine IR in this video. We'll be living at the IR level. Modules are the top-level containers of all other IR objects. They represent a translation unit, so you could think of them as being like a pre-processed C or C++ source file. Each module directly contains a list of global variables, a list of functions, a list of libraries or other modules it depends on, a symbol table, and various data about the module target's characteristics. Like regular assembly, each IR function is made up of a list of basic blocks, and each basic block is made up of a list of instructions. These IR instructions are what we'll be analyzing and transforming using our optimization. But the same could be done with literally any object in a module, including the module itself, for any optimization purpose. Logically, IR is implemented using static single assignment, which, at its core, means every variable is assigned exactly once, and every variable is defined before its use. LLVM verifies this before trying to lower an IR module to machine IR and it will stop what it's doing and complain if you deviate from these core tenants. IR itself is stored in memory as values contained in classes in the LLVM IR library, which we'll be getting into later. As files, IR is stored as bitcode, which is simply a serialized binary data format which can be marshaled to and from LLVM IR library classes. For us humans, it can also be stored as text, which looks like something between high-level source and assembly. This is a list of common instructions you'll see as you read IR assembly. Most of them are self-explanatory, so I won't be getting into the details of them, but you'll definitely want to bookmark the LLVM language reference documentation. Feel free to pause here if you want to read these very brief descriptions. Here are some other common but less recognizable instructions. The SELECT instruction is basically equivalent to a conditional evaluation, or an immediate IF. Phi instructions occur at the beginning of basic blocks, and they assign a value to a variable depending on which previous basic block branched to the current one. They don't really have an equivalent instruction or statement outside of IR, but they're a necessity because of the static single assignment implementation of LLVM. Get element pointer returns the address of a sub-element of an aggregate type. In other words, it returns a pointer to an element in an array or a field in a structure. Its use can sometimes be difficult to understand, so it has its own documentation, the returned pointer can be used to read or write values at its related address. This instruction only returns pointers, so it can't be used on aggregates stored in a register, since registers don't have addresses. To read or write to aggregates stored in registers, you have to use extract value and insert value. These are similar to get element pointer, except they read or write values of elements or fields instead of doing anything with addresses. They can also be given a range of sub-elements to read from or write to. The IR conversion instructions are akin to casting or boxing and unboxing operations. Bitcast converts the type of a value to a different type of the same size. It's a virtual no-op, as the value data doesn't change at all, only its representation. The trunk instructions, short for truncate, are used to convert a value of one type to a value of a smaller type, such as from a long integer to a short integer or a double to a float. The extend instructions, zero extend, sine extend, and floating point extend, are all used to perform the opposite, converting a value of one type to a value of a larger type. Pairs of conversion instructions, FP to UI, FP to SI, UI to FP, and SI to FP, 
are used for converting between floating point values and signed or unsigned integer values. These instructions involve rounding if the corresponding value can't be exactly represented by the destination type. The final conversion instructions, pointer to int and int to pointer, do exactly what they sound like. They convert integer values and pointers to and from each other. These are useful for things such as reading from and writing to hardware-defined I.O. addresses, or converting addresses to integers for display or logging. Now that you have an overview of IR and some of its instructions, let's take a look at some IR generated from actual compiled source code. To begin, let's write a simple C program to compare two floating point values directly. This could be done in C++, but because of name mangling and standard I.O. function complexity, it's much easier to parse the compiled LLVM IR assembly of a C program. This program will compare 0.2 with the result of 1 over the square root of 5 over the square root of 5, which, mathematically, should also be 0.2. As you can see, not only are the values not equal, 0.2 itself doesn't even really equal 0.2. So comparing floating point values this way is destined to fail. Now let's modify the program to compare the difference between the values against the machine epsilon. I'm writing this floating point absolute value function to be as simple as possible, because we're going to re-implement it in LLVMIR, so the less complex the better. We cast the address of the double to a long pointer, then dereference it so a bitwise AND can be applied to it. We mask off the most significant bit, as this is the sign bit. We can only get away with this because the size of long and size of double are the same in this instance, 64 bits. As I've said before, don't do this in production. Use a real floating point absolute value function instead. This equal approx function simply subtracts two double values, passes the difference to the absolute value function that was just written, and checks the result to see if it's less than the machine epsilon. Here we see the equals approx function working as intended. Now let's take a look at the IR of the original, unmodified program. This can be done by passing the dash capital S and dash emit dash LLVM arguments to Clang when compiling a single file. The output file specified will contain the IR assembly, provided compilation succeeds. This is the IR assembly for the compiled source of floatcompare.c. I'm going to briefly go over some of the code. This is a small section of module metadata, including the name of the source file from which it was generated and the target triple. These are the global constants containing the string literals used in the program. Here is where A and B are allocated slots on the stack. This is where A and B have their values placed on the stack, including the necessary division operations and calls to the square root function. This is the call to printf for displaying the values of A and B. The get element pointer instruction is being used to get the address of the first character in the global constant containing the format string. 
Here's the second call to printf, including the use of the select instruction for the conditional expression. This floating point compare instruction is what we're most interested in. The OEQ predicate stands for ordered and equal. Ordered simply means that neither operand contains a not a number value. We want to write a pass to replace instructions like this with the code from the floating point absolute value function that was demonstrated and switch the comparison predicate with an ordered less than, or OLT. We also want to replace the first operand with the difference absolute value and the second operand with an epsilon constant. We can't do any of this without knowing what IR to generate to match the floating point absolute value function, so let's take a look at the IR for that. And here it is. As you can see, it's fairly simple, and it compiles down to only a handful of native instructions. But we don't care about, nor do we need to use the stack, at least on x86-64 for the most part. So we can get rid of the stack and any memory-related instructions. Since we're not loading the result value from memory, we need a bit cast to convert the integer value back to a double. With these changes, we've reduced the native instruction count by one, and are no longer dereferencing any memory. But since we'll be inserting the IR instructions inline instead of creating a function to be called every time we find an equality comparison, we can eliminate the return instruction and the function declaration itself. These three IR instructions are all we need to insert for each relevant equality comparison, and they compile down to only four native instructions. Now that you've seen IR assembly in a practical sense, and a small example of how it can be translated to native code, we're just one step away from writing our optimization, learning how to use LLVM to actually do it. Let's talk a little bit about some of the IR library classes. First, their headers and implementation code can be truly insightful, as the official documentation currently is rather lacking, unfortunately. You can't go wrong looking at it, though, but you may find the actual source code to be more intuitive, and it tends to have more useful comments. Second, every class and function is under the LLVM namespace. I tend to write all my code that uses any LLVM library with the namespace included, so I'll be doing that here as well. There are only a few instances where importing the namespace is required, or where doing so at least makes things easy to the point of being worth it. One of these places is when writing legacy passes, which we'll be getting into later. The module class is the base IR container. It gives you access to all the functions, basic blocks, instructions, constants, and other constructs contained in a single compilation unit. The value class is the base datalite class, somewhat similar to a base object class like you might find in Java or c -sharp, except the value class is specific to IR-related data instead of the entire LLVM framework of libraries. It's the root of a deep inheritance hierarchy. Modules do not inherit from value. The type class is similar to the value class, except it's the base for all data types as opposed to data values. While value could be thought of as a variable, type is just that the type of the variable. Like the module class, type does not inherit from value. However, every value has a type associated with it. As I said, the value class hierarchy is rather deep, so we're going to briefly go over only a handful of them. It's important to note the way the inheritance is presented here isn't 100% accurate, as there may be some intermediate classes not shown. I'm only showing them this way to keep things simple and easier to understand. The constant class represents a construct in a module with immutable addresses, including immediate operands, string literals, functions, and global variables. Constant data array holds string literals, among other constant array types. Constant struct holds predefined structure values, and constant pointer null holds a null pointer of a given type. The basic block class is a container for sequentially executed instructions. They can be referenced and are all assigned the label type. The instruction class is the base class for all other IR instructions. The instruction class has a deep inheritance hierarchy of its own, as every single IR instruction class inherits from it in some way. The instructions.def header lists every IR instruction class categorically, so it can be useful to help understanding the instructions themselves and how they're related. The binary operator class is one of the few instruction classes that doesn't actually end in the word instruction. As the name implies, it represents every IR instruction that takes two operands and returns a value. The CMP inst class, or compare inst, is the base class for integer and floating point comparison instructions. 
The given type is always a 1-bit integer, or in other words, a Boolean type. The unary instruction class is the base for instructions that take a single operand and return a value, which includes casting instructions. In our case, we're most interested in the bitcast inst class, which obviously represents a bitcast instruction, as we'll be using it when we start to mutate IR in our optimization. Optimizations obviously must be able to change the instructions or values on which they're working, and there are several ways of doing so in the LLVM libraries. Inserting new instructions can be done in most cases by directly constructing them, although it's important to note that this is done exclusively via the new keyword or through named constructors. IR classes are not expected to exist on the stack. That said, you will never have to manually delete an instruction if it's inserted into a module. That's handled automatically by other code in an LLVM. However, you must also remember to actually insert your newly constructed instruction into a basic block for it to functionally exist. Alternatively, you can use the IRBuilder template class. This is the preferred method as IRBuilder automatically inserts instructions as it creates them. It also hides a lot of rarely used functionality and provides more options for instruction creation overall. I'll be demonstrating the use of IRBuilder later. Removing instructions is fairly trivial and can easily be accomplished with the erase from parent member function. Instructions can also be replaced with other ones, such as if you wanted to replace an add with a sub. This can be done manually by erasing the unwanted instruction and inserting the new one in the same location. However, doing so also requires that any users of the erased instruction be updated to use the newly inserted instruction. The utility function replace inst with inst handles this automatically and is the preferred way of doing it. Keep in mind, however, this function cannot replace an instruction with one that already exists in a basic block. It must be given an instruction that has not been inserted anywhere yet. If you don't need to replace an instruction with a different one, you can directly manipulate it using its member mutator functions. I'll be demonstrating the use of the setOperand member function to change the values of operands in a comparison instruction. Now that we know a small bit about the API available to us for working with IR, how do we implement an optimization? In LLVM, we use the concept of passes, as you've heard mentioned several times already. Passes are classes or structures with certain expected functions which are executed by pass managers in the LLVM pass pipeline. They are, in essence, the core of LLVM. Older passes employ inheritance to override the functions LLVM expects. Newer passes implement them as concrete member functions, and the pass manager will execute them via templates. Pass classes are registered and linked with LLVM either statically or dynamically. Statically linking passes requires pass implementations to be in the same source tree as LLVM, and usually require changes to the LLVM source itself, although this has changed recently. I'll be demonstrating static linking and registration to include changes to the LLVM source. There are different scope levels for each pass. Module level passes operate on an entire module and are executed once per module. Function level passes operate on individual functions within a module and are therefore called once for each function. They can operate on other values in the module outside of the function they're given, but this is de facto unexpected behavior and should be avoided. I'll be demonstrating how to write function passes. There are other levels, such as loop level passes, but their differences are minuscule, so I won't be getting into them. There are two types of passes, analysis and transformation passes. Analysis passes do not modify the IR in any way. They only gather information. Transformation passes are used to mutate IR. Transformation passes typically rely on analysis passes to provide them with information about what IR needs to be modified and where. Although analysis passes can rely on other analysis passes, transformation passes can rely on other transformation passes, and analysis passes can even rely on transformation passes. For example, an analysis pass may require that certain values have been simplified by a specific transformation pass prior to performing any analysis, and its analysis will then be used for further optimization by another transformation pass. Additionally, transformation passes can conduct their own analysis prior to or during transformation. However, for efficiency's sake and the way LLVM keeps track of changes to IR, it's usually better to separate the analysis role to an individual analysis pass instead of keeping it in the transformation pass. Printing passes are immutable passes that display information to the user, typically from an analysis pass. The function passes I'll be demonstrating will consist of an analysis pass, a printing pass, and a transformation pass. As previously stated, pass managers are used to execute passes in LLVM. However, they also keep track of what parts of a module have been modified by transformation passes and what parts have been preserved. 
This tracking allows for efficient scheduling and use of passes. For example, if part of a module that was analyzed by an analysis pass is later modified by a transformation pass, the results of the analysis pass are invalidated, and it will have to be completely rerun if a later pass depends on it. However, if the analyzed portion was not modified, the results of the analysis pass can be used again without having to rerun it. The efficient scheduling of passes in this manner helps to decrease overall compilation time. In LLVM, there are two pass managers, the Legacy Pass Manager and the so-called New Pass Manager. The Legacy Pass Manager is what all current LLVM documentation on pass development is based. It makes use of inheritance to implement passes, and pass registration is somewhat intricate. Legacy analysis passes are also printing passes. There is no logical separation. The pass dependency tree is statically generated as passes are registered, before any of them are executed. Each pass tells the pass manager any other passes it may depend on, and these passes are then loaded. The pass dependency tree is used to generate the pass execution schedule. Once this schedule is generated, it can't be changed. Legacy passes cannot dynamically run another pass without going outside of the pass pipeline, which completely defeats the efficiency of using a pass manager in the first place. Transformation passes tell the pass manager what they preserve by providing a public member function called get analysis usage. This function sets the scope of what parts of a module are guaranteed not to be modified by its transformation, such as control flow graphs, for example. And this function is called by the pass manager prior to the actual execution of the pass itself. This means there is no way for a transformation to tell the pass manager it actually preserved more IR if it determined it didn't really need to do as much modification. The most it can do is tell the pass manager it didn't modify anything as it was run, as this is a boolean value returned by the pass's primary execution function, true for modified, false for not modified. If the pass can make no preservation guarantees, and any IR modifications are made, however small they may be, all analysis results prior to its execution become invalidated. The new pass manager aims to fix many of the problems of the legacy manager. It employs CRTP, mix-ins, and uses the concept model idiom for polymorphism instead of absolute inheritance. This results in fewer vtable lookups and, as a result, faster code execution. Passes can conditionally execute other passes as needed instead of having to tell the pass manager which ones it may need. If a pass doesn't depend on another particular pass because it determined it doesn't need it, it isn't forced to load by the pass manager. Conversely, if a pass suddenly becomes needed, it can be loaded on request during the dependent pass's execution. IR modification and preservation is tracked after a transformation pass is executed, as the pass returns the scope of what it preserves from the primary execution function, the run function, instead of setting what it's guaranteed to preserve before it ever executes. This means that even if IR modification did occur, the scope of what was actually modified determines which preceding analysis results are invalidated. No more preservation guarantees need to be set before a transformation is run, and transformation modification results are no longer a simple yes or no. As a developer, perhaps the most significant improvement of the new pass manager is that it requires less code writing for all aspects of pass authoring, including registration, loading, and even for statically and dynamically linking it to LLVM. I'll be demonstrating both new and legacy passes, starting with new passes and then wrapping them with legacy passes so the code differences can be seen. All legacy passes inherit from the pass class. The primary execution function is called run on module for a module pass implementation and run on function for a function pass implementation. These functions return a boolean value that indicates whether or not they modified any IR. Analysis passes should, therefore, always return false. The pass registry class is used in a very roundabout way to register the pass via a specifically named initialization free function associated with a given pass through a pass initialization macro. It's easier to understand by demonstration, but it's still a pain. New passes inherit a mix-in template, where the template parameter is the pass class itself. The only required function is a public run function, which takes in a function or module reference, an analysis manager class template reference, and returns a preserved analysis value. The preserved analysis class can be used to determine the scope of what a pass preserves, as well as optionally specifying individual specific analysis passes which were preserved during the transformation pass's execution. Now that I've bored you to death with the minutia of some of the IR library API, it's time to use it. We're now ready to start writing our passes. We'll need two of them an analysis pass to locate the floating point to quality comparisons, and a transformation pass to insert the new instructions and mutate the comparison instruction. 
We'll start with the analysis passcode and then move on to the transformation passcode. The first thing we want to do is create a library containing the functions that will be used by our passes to find and modify the necessary IR. We could put this code in the pass implementations directly, but putting it in a separate library means that it could be used elsewhere, such as in a custom tool, and changes to it don't require the passes to be completely rebuilt as long as the interface stays the same. I'm creating a folder under LLVM's include directory, which will be used to hold all the header files for all the libraries I write. It could be named anything, but I'm naming it JVS. I then create the floatcompare.h header, which will contain the two main function declarations to be called by our passes. I wrap all of my interface code in a custom namespace to make it abundantly clear this is an original LLVM source. For the implementation code of this custom library, I create another folder with the same custom name under LLVM's lib directory, and under that, I create the float compare folder for this specific library. The parent directory is simply used for organization and won't contain any code files directly. The AP float and AP int headers contain declarations for arbitrary precision floating point and integer types, which will be used to help create the epsilon constant. Modules, functions, and basic blocks all implement the iterator concept, so they can be used in for each loops. Functions can be iterated from modules, basic blocks can be iterated from functions, and instructions can be iterated from basic blocks. Rather than suffering all the overhead of RTTI, LLVM has its own intrusive version of dynamic casting, which is much more efficient than the built-in C++ equivalent. That's what's being used here. We'll come back to implement this IR mutating function later. Now we create a CMake file for our library and define it to be built as an LLVM component using LLVM's add LLVM component library function.
the Intrinsics Gen dependency simply means that this library shouldn't be built before the LLVM Intrinsics Table Gen target. Any libraries that make use of IR should have this dependency. Now that we have our library being built by LLVM's CMake files, we can start our analysis pass library. Our analysis pass library also gets its own include directory under LLVM's include analysis directory. I create a float compare analysis header here to contain the analysis pass declaration and a custom results class exposed by the analysis pass. Raw OStream is a fast, stripped-down version of the standard library's OStream type. LLVM implements their own versions of Cout and Cair, which they call OutS and AirS. They also have a debugging output stream called DBGS. All of these are based on Raw OStream, and we'll be using it to print debugging messages to the user. The float comparisons class being written here will be used to map a function to all of its floating point equality comparison instructions. It'll be exposed by the analysis pass for use by the transformation pass. This is where our analysis pass is declared. Analysis passes are expected to have an alias type named result to be defined, and this result type is expected to be returned from the run function. We define two run functions. The first one, which takes a function reference and a function analysis manager reference, is required and called by the pass manager. The second one only takes a function reference, and is meant to be used by anything outside of the pass pipeline. We're doing this so our legacy analysis pass can use it, since it executes in a completely different pass pipeline from this one. Analysis passes are also expected to have a static member named key of the type analysis key. We don't want to make this member public if we can avoid it, so we make analysis info mix in a friend of our pass class so it can access it. I'm also going to declare our printing pass here, since printing passes and analysis passes are logically tightly coupled. Every pass that isn't an analysis pass is expected to return a preserved analyses value from the run function, so there's no need to define a result alias type here. Analysis pass library implementation is done similarly to the custom library we wrote earlier. I create a JVS folder under LLVM's lib analysis directory, which will contain the analysis pass implementation code.
The debug type macro defines the name of the pass to associate with debugging messages when used in conjunction with the LLVM debug macro, among other debugging related macros. The analysis pass run function implementation is simple. We just call find FP EQ comparisons from our custom library and use it to construct and return a float comparisons result value. The key static member definition is trivial, since LLVM uses the address of it for its analysis mapping purposes instead of any value it may contain. Here we see the printing pass retrieving the last valid result of our analysis pass by using the function pass manager's get result function template. This will execute the analysis pass if its results were invalidated by a transformation pass prior to this, or if the analysis pass hadn't been run before. Otherwise, it returns the cached results of the last execution of the analysis pass. Since the printing pass doesn't change any IR, it returns a preserved analyses value indicating that all IR and previous analysis results are preserved.
We tell CMake to link our analysis pass library with our custom library since we're making use of its functions. Since our legacy analysis pass will eventually make use of the standard library's optional template class, we make sure that the analysis pass library is built using the C17 standard. We tell CMake to link LLVM's analysis library with our analysis library, in addition to adding our analysis pass library's directory to it. LLVM uses an X macro header called passregistry.def to know what passes can be loaded and initialized. I'm writing a separate pass X macro header for our custom passes to be included by LLVM's pass registry so we can keep all our custom passes together and pollute LLVM's pass registry as little as possible. Just as a reminder, DBGS is a raw O stream that maps to standard air when debug messaging is enabled and requested. We can now include our own pass registry in LLVM's pass registry, which is located at lib passes passregistry.def. Now all that's left to get our analysis pass working is to include its header in passbuilder.cpp. Rerun your LLVM build commands, whatever they may be, and take a break while everything rebuilds. We use the opt tool to execute our passes. The dash dash analyze argument indicates that we don't want to generate an output file, and the dash dash passes argument specifies a comma separated list of passes to run. In this case, we're running our printing pass against our demo program's IR. We don't need to specify the analysis pass, as the printing pass automatically requests it. Here we see the analysis pass finding a single floating point equality comparison instruction in main, and the printing pass displaying it. If you really wanted to just execute the analysis pass without the printing pass, you could do so by specifying its name wrapped in arrow brackets prefixed with the word require. But as you can see, nothing spectacular happens. The analysis pass executes and its results are simply discarded instead of being displayed. Now let's start on our transformation code.
These next two lines use the getOperand function to retrieve the values being compared in the floating point compare instruction. The 0 and 1 arguments are the indices of the operands being retrieved. We need to change the comparison predicate from equal to less than, or from not equal to greater than or equal to, and we need to keep the ordered or unordered predicate flag as well. I'm using a switch statement in a lambda to accomplish this. The containing module is needed to get a reference to its LLVM context, and the LLVM context is needed to get the integer and double types to be used. I'm using an AP int to define the epsilon constant since it can be directly represented this way without rounding errors. The bits to double function reinterprets the integer as a 64 bit double without any rounding or conversion. At this point, we're ready to start inserting new IR instructions. We'll need a subtraction instruction for the two comparison operands and the instructions needed to implement a floating point absolute value evaluation. I find it's easier to list the instructions I want to insert as comments, so I'll be doing that here as well.
The logic for our transformation function is complete. Creating the transformation pass and the transformation pass library is done almost exactly in the same manner as the analysis pass and analysis pass library. However, unlike LLVM's analysis pass library, LLVM doesn't have a single transformation pass library, so we don't have anything obvious to link our transformation pass library against. Instead, we'll link LLVM's IPO library with our transformation pass library. IPO stands for Interprocedural Optimization, and it contains most of LLVM's performance optimizing transformation passes. We'll also need to link our transformation pass library with both our custom library and our analysis pass library, since it makes use of both of them. Like the analysis pass, our transformation pass will have two run functions, the one required by the pass manager and one for use by our legacy transformation pass. The statistic header contains a statistic macro used to define variables that indicate items that may be of interest to the user, such as the number of instructions that were changed or inserted, for example. They use the debug type macro to show which statistics are associated with which passes. Here we see the use of the none preserved analyses value, indicating that all previous analysis results become invalid if this transform modifies any IR. OptNone is a function attribute which can be set manually by a programmer to indicate that a function should not be optimized. Clang sets this attribute on every function it compiles if either O0 is specified or if no optimization level is given and the default optimization level of the target is O0. Functions that have this attribute shouldn't be transformed.
The undef directive should be used if passes.def is included in a regular file outside of passregistry.def. But because of where it's being included inside passregistry.def, which is right above other undef directives, it's okay to remove them. It's also safe to keep them if you don't want to remove them. Just like with our analysis pass, the last step is to include our transformation pass header in passbuilder.cpp. Rebuild LLVM, then go back to your command line to run the opt tool again. This time, since we're running a transformation pass, we specify an output file for the transformed IR. The output file will be bitcode instead of IR assembly, so we give it the BC extension to differentiate it. To compile IR down to an executable file, you can pass it to Clang as if it was a regular source file, including any library or linker options you would normally specify. Except there's one catch. The program didn't change. The equality comparison is still being done directly. Running opt with the dash dash stats option shows no statistics being generated. Running it with dash dash debug reveals the problem. Our transform is following the rules and ignoring opt none. To stop Clang from adding it to every function it compiles, we have to recompile the original code with two extra options, dash capital X Clang, immediately followed by dash disable dash capital O zero dash opt none. When we rerun the opt command with stats, we see a report showing one comparison was converted. We can now rerun the Clang command and try our transformed program. we can finally see the floating point comparison following the semantics we want, and that our transform was successful in generating the code to do so. We're not done yet. Let's move on to wrapping our current passes with legacy passes. This should give you an idea of how much easier it is to write a modern pass compared to a legacy one. Legacy passes can't be contained in a custom namespace, as the pass registration macros assume the LLVM namespace to be used. This means the pass must be declared in the LLVM namespace or in the global namespace, which is to say, no namespace. Like modern analysis passes that require a static key member, all legacy passes require a static ID char member. Its value also doesn't matter, because its address is used for analysis results mapping, just like with the modern analysis passes. Unlike modern printing passes, any legacy pass can override a print function for displaying information to the user. When opt is run with the dash dash analyze argument, this function is automatically invoked.
Legacy Pass constructors must call the parent class constructor and pass the static ID member by reference to it. They must also call an initialization function defined later by a macro to have the pass registered with the Legacy Pass registry. Instead of returning a preserved analysis value, legacy passes define what they're guaranteed to preserve by overriding the git analysis usage function, which is called before the pass executes. This initialize pass macro is one of several used to define the pass initialization function used in the pass constructor. The arguments are the pass short name, the pass description, a boolean value indicating whether or not it's a control flow graph pass, and a boolean value indicating whether or not it's an analysis pass. This create free function will be declared elsewhere, but implemented here. It's meant to be used to create an instance of the pass in the absence of having access to the pass class itself as many passes are declared and defined locally to a single compilation unit. Now we'll create our legacy transformation pass.
the transform calls the get analysis function template to get the cached results of our legacy analysis pass, or to have it run again if its results were invalidated. This is another form of the pass initialization macro, and this one expects a dependent pass to be specified. Since we're relying on the results of our legacy analysis pass, we list it as a dependency here. Legacy passes don't have an X macro header based pass registry like modern ones do, but we're going to make one so it's easier to add new passes later. Otherwise, every time we create a legacy pass, we have to change four to six other files just to get them to work. This is where the create free functions are declared for legacy analysis passes. And this is where the create free functions are declared for legacy transformation passes. This is where every legacy analysis pass is automatically initialized.
And this is where every legacy transformation pass is automatically initialized. This is where every legacy pass initialization function is declared. This is where every legacy pass is created. Even though these functions return a pass pointer, the pass lifetime is managed by the pass registry, which the pass initialization function uses for self-registration when the pass is constructed, so there's no need to explicitly delete it. Finally, the legacy passes must be initialized manually in the opt tool. This same code must be repeated for any other tool that uses a legacy pass pipeline, such as Bugpoint in order for our custom legacy passes to be available there. But we're only modifying opt since it's the only tool I'll be demonstrating. Rebuild LLVM once more and head back to the command line. Legacy passes don't use the dash dash passes argument with opt. Instead, their pass name is used as a direct command line argument, and all of them can be listed in opt's help text. And there you have it. Legacy passes serve the same purpose as modern passes, but are a bit more complex and unwieldy to develop in comparison. <laughs>